Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome to The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. My name is Dylan Zavagno. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library, and I've been heading this unique program series for the past several months, the Fight to Integrate Deerfield 60-Year Reflection, which focuses on the events around the intended integrated housing development that in 1959 was blocked by Deerfield residents and local governments, and instead turned into public parks that stand today. Because this is our finale program for the series, I wanted to say a few words before I introduce our speaker, Richard Rothstein. There are way too many people to thank by name who have made this series possible, so broadly, let me thank all of the library staff and the board, as well as the Friends of the Library, the Archshay Archives, the local middle and high schools, local religious groups, and all of you in the community who have attended programs, provided materials for our archives, or sent in reflections, or just shared your story. Thank you also to our many expert program presenters who truly came from around the country to share their own research, writing, and personal histories to help illuminate what happened here 60 years ago and the legacy it leaves today. It would be easy to attend a program or two this anniversary year and then look away from this history. But our hope is that we have started conversations in the community. We at the library are committed to offering ways for continued learning, research, and reflection. To that end, there are two things I would like to mention. Uh, for this full anniversary year, we are leaving our exhibits up outside in the hallway. We might leave them up longer, we'll see. Um, there's also photographs upstairs in the front lobby and across from the youth desk, so if you haven't seen those, we encourage you to look at these amazing <laughs> photographs from longtime resident Art Shea, as well as our many original documents. Number two, all of our online resources and our newly digitized archives, thank you, Anne. Uh, Yay. Thank you. Uh, we have original documents, newspaper clippings, audio interviews, and videos of past programs, and more. Um, most importantly, we are still interested in collecting your stories and reflections. So that's things from the past, or if you have a contemporary reflection you'd like to share for future researchers when they come to see um, how Deerfield reflected on its history. So you can find all of those. Um, there's more information in our brochure that was on your chair. And the uh, link is deerfieldlibrary.org slash FID. That's on the back of your program brochure. Now, let me introduce our speaker tonight. Richard Rothstein is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and of the Haas Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of the Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. His book has been widely praised in glowing reviews from the New York Times Book Review, NPR, Slate, the New York Review of Books, the American Conservative, and people from ta Coates to Bill Gates. Richard Rothstein's work has been foundational for us in planning this series, and has gone a long way to changing the conversation nationally about the history and legacy of housing discrimination. His book, The Color of Law, actually does discuss Deerfield history among many examples and connects our local history to the larger story of segregation in our country. I've had the pleasure of seeing Richard present before. You guys are in for a treat. Just a word on how this is gonna go. Uh, Richard will speak for about 45 minutes. We're gonna have a Q&A. We're just gonna stand up and project, and Richard will call on you. And then we do have books for sale, and we'll be doing a book signing afterwards, so we hope you'll take advantage of that as well. Uh, we also have assisted listening devices available. If anyone needs them, you can just wave your hand. That will be getting the sound right in from the speakers there, if you can't hear. So please join me in welcoming Richard Rothstein. Dylan. This looks like one of those World War II setups with a 
different radio stations. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Come on in, there's still seats all around there. Um, and for engaging in this uh, conversation with me this evening. As you all know, I can say that because uh, very often I speak to groups where everybody is half my age. That's not true tonight. So I can say, <laughs> as you all know, uh, in the 20th century we had a civil rights movement. Uh, civil rights lawyers began by challenging segregation in law schools because they figured the judges were too dense to understand anything else they might be able to figure out that you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. And then that led to challenges to segregation in colleges and universities. And then, as you all know, that led to a decision to... I'm just gonna have you speak um, a little bit more directly into that. <laughs> well, where are the other 15, though? Yeah, I know. <laughs> here, here, this is just separate audio recording. Okay, that should be good. Okay. Uh, the Brown decision in 1954, um, abolished segregation, legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And then uh, the Brown decision inspired, gave new impetus to, a new motivation to a civil rights movement of the streets that engaged in marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience. People lost their lives, uh, not just through litigation and, and uh, legislative action. And then as a result of that civil rights movement of activists, we abolished segregation in the 1960s and everything from lunch counters to buses to swimming pools to interstate transportation of all kinds, public accommodations of all kinds. And then, yet, at the end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement dropped the ball and went home and left untouched the biggest segregation of all which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, I've lived in many of them. Every one that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were either all white or mostly white, and clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black. We came to understand in the Civil Rights Movement that racial segregation was wrong, it was immoral, it was harmful both to blacks and to whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy? How can it be that having come to these understandings in the 1960s, we've ignored the biggest segregation of all, the fact that we look like an apartheid society? And I think in part it's because it's harder to desegregate neighborhoods than to desegregate water fountains. You can pass a law saying that everybody can drink out of it the same water fountain, the next day people can indeed drink out of the same water fountain, or sit at the same lunch counter, or ride anywhere on a bus. So if we pass a law abolishing residential segregation, the next day things wouldn't look much different. And so what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, I include myself in this, so I'm not putting anything on you that I don't put on myself, what we've done is we've adopted a national myth, a rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves for not addressing the systematic segregation of this society. Um, the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves, oh, those other forms of segregation that we abolished, whether it was law schools or elementary schools or lunch counters or buses, all of those were done by government. They were the product of laws, of regulation, of ordinances, public policy. If it was the federal government doing it, uh, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment, a civil rights violation. If it was a state or local government doing it, it was a violation of the Fourteenth Amendment, another civil rights violation. And if you have a civil rights violation, you have to remedy it. It's obvious that's what our Constitution requires us to do. But the residential segregation, we tell ourselves, oh, that's entirely different. That wasn't done by government. That wasn't done by law, by ordinance, by regulation. Policy. That just sort of happened by accident. It happened because, oh, bigoted white homeowners wouldn't sell a home. 
most African Americans. What are my African Americans in, um, in, uh, in white communities or all white communities? Or because actors in the private economy, not government, but banks, real estate agents, private actors, acted in a discriminatory way in the way they either sold homes or, or showed homes or, or rented them uh, or lent, lent mortgages. And that created segregation. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's because blacks and whites just like to live with each other in the same race. They feel more comfortable that way. And that's the cause of residential segregation. Or maybe we say it's just income differences. You know, African Americans, on average, not always, but on average, have lower incomes than whites. And they just can't afford to move to middle class communities like this one. That's the reason we have residential segregation. All of these individual, maybe bigoted, but uh, individual, personal, private activities is what's created segregation. And what happened by accident can only happen by accident. It's not our obligation to do anything about it. It's not a civil rights violation. The government didn't do it. There's no Fifth Amendment or Fourteenth Amendment violation here. It's just an accidental occurrence. We give a name to this. It's a name we all use. We say what we've got is de facto segregation when it comes to residences. And de facto segregation is not really because it's just there. Something that is too bad, but nothing that we feel obligated to do anything about, despite our understanding that, that, that segregation of any kind is wrong, immoral, harmful <coughs> of blacks and whites and incompatible with our self conception as a democratic society. Well, someone asked me just before uh, we came in here how I got into this topic, and I told him that I spent a good part of my career until I got into this uh, 10 years ago uh, as a hobby in my retirement. Um, <laughs> uh, I, spent, uh, I spent my career as a policy analyst of education, education policy. I knew nothing about housing. I knew nothing about this history. I was the education columnist for the New York Times. I uh, wrote about education policy for a research institute in Washington and for a lot of other publications. <coughs> And in the course of doing this, I came to understand that the education policy this country was following in the 1990s and early 2000s was made no sense to me. Let's put it that way. Made no sense to me. It was focused on the problem of what we call the achievement gap, the fact that African American children and other disadvantaged children, to, to a lesser extent but still, have lower achievement on average than white middle class children. And all of our education policy was focused on addressing this achievement gap. And we came to this theory, and it was a shared across the political spectrum. Uh, we came to this theory that uh, the reason we have an achievement gap is because schools and teachers have low expectations for disadvantaged children. And if only we tested the children more and held teachers and schools accountable for those test scores, the achievement gap would disappear. And some of you are laughing, but this was such a widely shared view that it was enacted into a law that was sponsored by the Republican president of the United States and in the Senate by the most liberal Senator Ted Kennedy and the House by the most liberal congressman George Miller. There's no child left behind law. And it required testing, excessive testing of children from the third to the eighth grade and punishments for schools and teachers if those schools didn't close the achievement gap once they saw their test scores. Well, I regarded this as utter nonsense. Uh, and I wrote many columns along these lines. And uh, uh, for example, I'm not going to go into it in great detail because you'd have to like, be back for another lecture on this. <laughs> for example, uh, uh, African-American children in urban neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate of middle class children. Four times the rate. And they have asthma because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more deteriorated buildings, more burden in the environment. And if a child has asthma, the child is likely to be up at night wheezing, come to school drowsy the next day, maybe sleepless. And I tried to explain that you have two groups of children who are identical groups in every respect, same racial makeup, same social and economic background, same family structure, uh, identical groups except one group uh, had a slightly higher rates of asthma than the other group, uh, that group would have lower average achievement. Because no matter how much you test the children, 
testing doesn't make a child wide awake if they've been out at night reason. And I went through column after column explaining this, going through the same exercise, logical exercise, of two identical groups of children. But one group had a higher rate of lead poisoning, which has a concrete impact on cognitive ability, or a higher rate of homelessness, or a higher rate of stress from economic insecurity. Each of these things, no matter how high teacher expectations were, no matter how good the curriculum was, was going to create an average difference no matter what the teacher did or the school did. It's not to say that good teachers don't do better than bad teachers. Of course they do. But two groups of children, one of which has a higher rate of asthma than the other, is not going to achieve the same even under the best instruction. On average, there are some children with asthma who always achieve at higher levels than typical children without because there's a distribution of outcomes for every human characteristic and those distributions overlap. But these causes have average effects which uh, are not uh, remediable by more testing or higher expectations. Well, so I thought about all this for a while as I was writing about it, and um, then I came to the conclusion. It took me a while, I'm a slow learner. But yeah, I came to the conclusion, so really, I'm surprised. I'm mad for shame that it took me so long to realize this. But I came to the conclusion that it's one thing if, if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or stress or homelessness. What happens if you have a school where every child? has either asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or, or stress from economic insecurity. I can go on and list many, many other characteristics. How can that school ever be expected to produce the same kind of achievement as a school where children come to school well rested and not poisoned and in secure homes and in economically secure environments? It's obviously impossible to have that expectation. Well, we call schools where we concentrate children we call them segregated schools. And the reality is that today, that today, schools are more segregated than they have been at any time in the last 45 years. And why is that? The schools are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to look into this topic as an education policy. Housing policy is education policy. I didn't plan to look into stuff about housing. It seemed to me obvious that the best way to solve our education problems is to desegregate neighborhoods. And then I read a Supreme Court decision in 2007. And that decision of the U.S. Supreme Court concerned two school districts, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. And both of those districts had a very, very token desegregation plan, very token. They both allowed parents to choose the school that their child would attend within the district. But if the choice was going to exacerbate segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child that would mitigate segregation. So if you had a school that was all white or mostly white, and there was one place left in the school, and both a black and a white child applied for it, the black child would be given some preference. Don't desegregate the school. A trivial, a trivial program. I mean, how many times do you have one place left in the school? Both a black and a white child applied for it. But the Supreme Court examined this program in both of those districts that said it was unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the opinion, the controlling opinion. He explained that the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. It's true, because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. I thought that was a pretty wise observation. I'm the Chief Justice's part. <laughs> in fact, why they're segregated. And they went on to say that the school, that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated de facto for all the individual, private, decisions of economic trends, he went through all the things I listed before. And he said that if you have de facto segregation, it's impermissible for the government to do anything about it. What happened by accident can only not happen by accident. Well, I read this decision, I pondered it, and I remember reading about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, some years before, one of the two districts that was concerned with this decision. And in Louisville, a white homeowner in a single-family home suburb called Shiley um, had a friend, an African-American friend, living in the center city of Louisville, renting an apartment. The African-American friend was a decorated Navy veteran. The uh, a wife and a daughter uh, he, uh, uh, had a good job, wanted to buy a single-family home, but uh, nobody could, would sell him one. So the white homeowner 
bought another home in the suburb of Shire, and resold it to his African American friend. And when the African American friend moved in, an angry white mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. The police couldn't identify a single perpetrator. They dynamited and firebombed the home, and still not a single perpetrator could be identified. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition for having sold the home in a white neighborhood to an African American family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police and the courts and the entire criminal justice system are enforcing racial boundaries. And at that point, I decided to look into it further. And uh, that's what led to this, this book that I'm talking about. I found first that this was not an unusual incident. Instance. Uh, I'm not exaggerating here. There were thousands of incidents of police protected mob violence to drive African Americans out of the homes they had legitimately bought in white neighborhoods in the mid 20th century. Thousands of cases of police protected mob violence. Uh, cities across the country. You know, 100 here, 100 there. And then I looked into it further and I found it wasn't just the use of the courts and the police and the criminal justice system to enforce racial boundaries, but that there were many federal, state, and local policies that uh, were designed explicitly explicitly with racial intent to create and enforce racial boundaries. I concluded at the end of the book that uh, we have not a de facto system of residential segregation. But our system of residential segregation is just as much a civil rights violation as the segregation of water fountains or buses. And if that's true, if the reason we have residential segregation is because of violations of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment by government actors, then every one of us has an obligation if we take our responsibilities as citizens seriously to do something about it. Not just to think it's too bad, but to do something about it. Well, let me spend a few minutes uh, talking this evening about some of the major federal policies that the federal government followed to uh, ensure that blacks and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area. The first one I want to talk about is uh, public housing, which I think all of us misunderstand. At least I did. Maybe you were more smarter about this than I am, but I misunderstood it before I did this research. We think of public housing as a place where poor people live. Lots of single mothers with children, lots of young men that have jobs in a formal economy, attracting the attention of the police, uh, engaging in confrontations, deteriorated buildings, lots of dirt, not grass surrounding them. That's our image of public housing. That's not how public housing began in this country. Uh, the first civilian public housing in this country was built by the, in the New Deal by the Franklin Roosevelt administration. Uh, in uh, 1933, the first New Deal agency was the Public Works Administration, and it built housing. It was not for poor people. Uh, it was for working class families, lower middle class families who had jobs, stable incomes, could afford to pay the full cost of rent in public housing, Public housing was designed to solve a housing shortage because little construction was going on in the Depression. It wasn't a welfare program for poor people. Um, everywhere the government built public housing, it segregated it, creating separate projects for African Americans and whites. Most whites, most public housing was for whites. And those of you who have the book will, will turn to the frontispiece of the book, the, the one that faces the title page. Picture, and you'll see a picture of Franklin Roosevelt giving the keys to the 100,000th family, uh, 100, family in the New Deal to receive public housing. And it's a clearly middle class white crowd, all 100% white, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Not a place that we think of as having all white public housing today. 25% of the country was unemployed at that time, but public housing was for the 75%. Well, I say everywhere the government built this housing, it segregated separate projects for whites and blacks frequently. It segregated neighborhoods that had previously been integrated. And that may have surprised some of you, but in the mid early 20th century, we had many, many integrated downtown urban neighborhoods. 
for the simple reason that the, we were a manufacturing economy in those days, none of this internet stuff. You know, it was a world. <laughs> we were making things, and factories had to be located either near a deep water port or a railroad terminal to get their parts and ship their final products. So the factories were concentrated in a single factory district. And the workers didn't have all the fields to get to work. They had to walk to work or take short street car rides. So if you had a factory district that had you know, Irish workers and Italian workers and Jewish workers and African Americans, they all lived in broadly the same neighborhoods. Of course, there were clusters here and there, but broadly the neighborhoods were integrated. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in those neighborhoods to create segregation for the first time in those communities. The first project that the Public Works Administration built was in Atlanta, Georgia, in an integrated neighborhood. Atlanta had segregated schools and segregated water fountains and segregated everything else, but not segregated neighborhoods because workers had to be able to walk to work. You couldn't have a segregated neighborhood to get a workforce that was diverse, which the factories needed. So Atlanta built a demolished housing in a neighborhood called the Flats near downtown Atlanta. It was about half white, half black, to build a project for whites only. And the African Americans who lived in that neighborhood were displaced and had to double up, triple up with relatives, find less settled places to live. Whenever I talk in the library, I, I uh, urge you all to go, uh, well, not take turns, I guess, but to check out the uh, uh, Langston Hughes' autobiography, the great African American novelist, poet, playwright. Uh, his autobiography describes how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood called the Central Neighborhood of Cleveland. It's not what we think of Cleveland as today as having a downtown integrated neighborhood. But Langston Hughes says he went to high school. His best friend was Polish in high school. He dated a Jewish girl there. That was what happens in an integrated neighborhood. Not to everybody, but to some. Uh, the Paul Burst administration went into that central neighborhood of Cleveland and demolished housing and built separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans. And with other projects that built elsewhere in Cleveland, also segregated, created a pattern of segregation that exists in the state. In my book, I like to talk about the self-satisfied smug places. So you know, you don't have this exhibit, you can no longer claim that status. Um, but the self-satisfied smug places, for example, like Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, you know, the area between Harvard and MIT, MIT the Central Square neighborhood, was an integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. Also about you know, 60, 40, roughly half white, half black. Public Works Administration demolished housing there and created separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans. Um, and in other projects similarly segregated throughout the Boston area created a pattern of segregation that persists to this day. Um, during World War II, the federal government's uh, efforts to um, segregate the country intensified because hundreds of thousands of workers blocked the centers of war production to take jobs in the war industries that hadn't existed before. And they overwhelmed communities where they migrated to take these jobs. There was no housing for them. And if the government wanted the ships and the tanks and the aircraft to be built and to be produced, it had to somehow find, find, somehow find housing for the workers. I think there's a seat back here. They had to, the government had to find housing um, for the workers. And it did. And everywhere, everywhere, the government built housing. These workers working in the same war plants, it built segregated housing. And in many cases, creating segregation that otherwise could never have existed because these were places that never had African Americans there before. So there were no even informal patterns of segregation. The West Coast is a good example of that. Not the self-satisfied smug area, Berkeley. <laughs> There's a suburb of Berkeley, and just north of Berkeley, called Richmond, which became the center of shipbuilding on the West Coast. It was a tiny community, about 20,000 residents, all white. A uh, few African Americans working as domestics in uh, the homes of white families, but that was about it. By the end of the war, there were 100,000 workers who flocked there to take jobs in the shipbuilding yards, in the shipyards of, of Richmond. The government had to find housing for those workers, and it did. It created shoddy temporary housing for the African American workers along the railroad tracks and in the industrial area in Richmond and down into Berkeley. And it created more stable housing uh, for the white workers uh, more inland in the residential areas near shopping and other amenities. The city of Richmond explained that uh, you didn't need to build permanent housing for the African American workers because they would have to leave Richmond at the end of the war. Whereas the white uh, this was the city of Richmond's policy. Um, Berkeley had a similar policy. After World War, and, and let me just say that the, the 
this throughout, this is a good example to use because nobody can claim that the government was simply building on prior informal patterns of segregation that weren't enough African Americans on the West Coast before World War II uh, to have serious segregation informally. The, the historians divide up the migration of African Americans out of the South into the North and West and Midwest into two periods. The first great migration, which took place in World War I, and that brought large numbers of African Americans here to Milwaukee and to uh, Detroit. But the second migration is what brought African Americans uh, to the West Coast now during World War II. So this policy of the federal government to build segregated housing for war workers was what's responsible for the segregation that still persists today in Portland and Seattle and uh, well, San Francisco and Los Angeles. After World War II, there was still an enormous housing crisis in the country. Uh, not only had no housing been built during the Depression, except for those few projects that I mentioned, but not much housing had been built. And uh, during the war, it was uh, illegal to use construction materials for civilian purposes, unless it was for war workers. And uh, then after the war, millions of returning war veterans came home, usually I tell people it's their grandparents or great parents, grandparents, here it's your parents, but <laughs> <laughs> what I say? Uh, kind of came home from the war. Needing housing, uh, beginning the baby boom, double, tripled up with relatives because no housing had been built. And the President Truman had to respond to this enormous housing crisis, a homelessness crisis, much like we have today. And he did so by proposing a vast expansion of the national public housing system. Again, remember, not for poor people. This was workers, returning war veterans who had jobs in the post war economy but, and who could pay rent and did pay rent wasn't subsidized for the most part, um, but from no housing was available. And conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's expansion of public housing, not because they didn't like poor people, as I said, it wasn't for poor people and not for racial reasons, they were quite content with being segregated. They wanted to defeat it because they thought public housing was socialistic and the government shouldn't be involved in housing, it should be done by the private market, even though the private market wasn't building any housing for working class families. And so they came up with a device to defeat the bill, the conservatives did, which we refer to uh, as a poison pill strategy. Uh, some of you may have heard of that term. Uh, a poison pill strategy is a strategy where opponents of the bill in Congress propose an amendment to the bill, which they think can get a majority. And when the amendment is passed, and it's attached to the bill, and then the full bill comes up on the floor of the House or the Senate, that amendment makes the bill unpalatable to a different majority, and the bill goes down to defeat. So the, the amendment was the poison pill. And conservatives in Congress proposed an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act along the following lines. They said, from now on, public housing has to be integrated. No more dis racial discrimination in public housing. Uh, no more segregation. It was a cynical amendment. They didn't want public housing at all. But they planned to vote for the amendment, for this non-discrimination amendment. They thought they could get some northern liberals to vote with them. That would create a majority. The amendment would be passed. And then when the full bill came up on the floor of the House and the Senate, the conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by southern Democrats, who would join them in voting against the bill. That would create a majority against the bill. And the entire bill would go down. So liberals in Congress were faced with a difficult choice, and I'm not minimizing the difficulty of their choice, the terrible dilemma they faced. Were they going to support the integration amendment with the result that no housing would be built to address this terrible housing crisis that we had? Or were they going to oppose the integration amendment in order to get public housing, more housing, that to meet the desperate housing shortage that existed? Well, as I say, it wasn't an easy choice. I'm not minimizing the difficulty. But the liberals, led by your senator, Paul Douglas, uh, formerly a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, decided to oppose the integration amendment. He was joined by his closest colleague in the Senate, uh, Mr. Civil Rights, a senator from Minnesota, and Hubert Humphrey. Uh, they persuaded their uh, fellow liberals to vote against the integration amendment. 
but to deny the conservatives in charge they needed for this course to kill. Senator Douglas got up on the floor of the Senate and made a speech along the following lines. He said, I want to say to my Negro friends that you'll be better off if this integration amendment is defeated and you get the housing that you need. And you will be if the integration amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. Well, again, I'm not minimizing the difficulty of the choice, but I don't think we'd be better off, even though we would have paid a terrible price in an ongoing housing crisis uh, if we'd taken the other course. Because the vast expansion of public housing on a segregated basis that took place after that 1949 Housing Act was passed, creating public housing with giant towers everywhere that we're familiar with on a segregated basis, uh, is responsible. Not only for the achievement gap in schools, as I started with earlier, but for health disparities between African Americans and whites. African Americans have shorter sure life expectancies, greater rates of heart disease because they live in more polluted neighborhoods. Um, it's responsible for the confrontations, tragic confrontations between police and young men in. American low income communities because we concentrated those men in single neighborhoods without access to jobs, to good jobs, or the transportation to get to those jobs. It's responsible, even I think, for the very, very dangerous political polarization we have in this country today, which tracks in part uh, racial lines, it's not targeting, it tracks racial lines. And how can we ever expect to create the common national identity that's essential? this democracy uh, if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to identify with each other's life experiences to empathize with each other. So Senator Douglas, Senator Humphrey, their fellow liberals solved the short time term housing crisis and the price that they paid is one that we are still paying today. It's much easier to see short-term benefits than it is to see long-term costs. Well, very soon after the vast expansion of the public housing program took place in 1949, another development occurred. Oh, let me say before I say that, let me just add that the federal government then used that vote, used the vote uh, against the integration amendment in Congress as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs, all federal housing programs. Fifteen years, making it into the 1960s. Well, a development occurred, as I say, after those public housing units were built. Uh, that was quite surprising to housing experts, to policy experts, and it happened quickly and around the country. And that was that all the white designated projects developed large numbers of vacancy, and the white projects had long waiting lists. Soon, even the most bigoted public officials housing officials couldn't justify a situation where some of their projects were half empty and the others in the same city in long waiting lists. So they eventually opened up all the projects to African Americans. And soon, the formerly white projects filled up with African Americans, and public housing became primarily serving in places like Chicago and elsewhere in the East and Midwest an African American institution. And about the same time, the industry that I talked about before that needed to be near Deepwater Port where Renault turned all that, the cities, moved to the suburbs, moved to, to um, rural areas. And you might know that in this area as well. Uh, you can't drive up the highway without seeing one building here. But the result of that kind of movement, um, they no longer needed to be near Deepwater Port where Renault turned all the highways were get their parts and ship their final products out of it. <coughs> so the jobs, the good jobs that used to be located in the center cities where the public housing, which is now predominantly African American located, the jobs disappeared. The African Americans in those projects, as well as those in the surrounding area, became poorer and poorer, with less and less access to good jobs. Public housing had to begin to be subsidized because people could no longer pay the full cost of the housing and their rent. And once it came to be subsidized, the government stopped investing in it, stopped maintaining it, the project deteriorated, and we got the kind of urban slums, public slums, that we associate with public housing today. Uh, but that's not how public housing began. So the question is, uh, why did all those vacancies occur in the white projects and not in the black ones? And that was because of a 
not a federal program that was even more powerful in creating segregation across the country than the public housing program. And that was a program of the Federal Housing Administration that was designed, explicitly designed on a racial basis to move the entire white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in the suburbs like that suburb of the world over I talked about before. And that's how the country came to be suburbanized by the Federal Housing Administration, by the Federal Housing Administration program. Remember, at that time, most people, except for the very wealthy, were living in cities. This proposal to build suburbs, giant subdivisions of single-family homes seemed crazy. Who was going to want to live in a single-family home out in the suburbs? Nobody thought that the developer built a suburb. Not really. Maybe, maybe those people are crazy. I don't know. Maybe they know better than I do. But um, nobody thought this was a serious effort when developers like William Levitt who wanted to build Levittown or any of the hundreds and hundreds of other projects like across in every metropolitan area of the country that some of you may remember hearing a song that Pete Seeger used to sing about the little boxes on the hillside and the ticky tack and they all looked the same. That was a development built about the same time, about 1950, South of San Francisco, just about as large as Levin Town. And everywhere between San Francisco and New York, we had these developments here in the city as well. No bank, no bank would lend Levitt or Henry Dolger who built the, the little boxes on the hillside. No bank would lend it on such a crazy project. Uh, the only way that they could get the funds to buy the land and build these developments by the town was 17,000 homes to get no buyers. Nobody thought they ever would have buyers. The only way you could get the money to build this development was by going to the Federal Housing Administration. So the biggest plans for the development, what materials you're going to use for the construction, the layout of the streets, the design of the homes, and <coughs> a commitment to never sell a home to an African American. Mm -hmm. And with that commitment, the Federal Housing Administration guaranteed these bank loans. The Federal Housing Administration even required that uh, Levitt um, place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans as a condition of this loan. And many of you live in homes today which, whose deeds still have these clauses saying that your home is for Caucasians only, and very few of your deeds. Uh, maybe not tonight, maybe tomorrow, but let's uh, see what they say. Um, this was not the action of rogue bureaucrats at the FHA. This was uh, an explicit policy of the Federal Housing Administration. It was stated in the um, underwriting manual of the, the, the Federal Housing Administration, which was distributed to appraisers all over the country, whose job it was to evaluate the applications of developers uh, for, the developing, for building these subdivisions. The manual said explicitly that you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a loan to a developer who was going to integrate the community. The manual even said that um, you couldn't recommend a loan, a, ga a guarantee of a loan, for a developer who was going to build an all white development which was located near where African Americans were living. Because such a development, in the words of the manual, I'm quoting, would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the manual said. Federal writ manual. There is nothing de facto about this. Nothing. It is an unconstitutional system of residential segregation that we, our government, created. Um, and as I said earlier, and I'll say it over and over, but if that's the case, then we have an obligation to remedy it. What are the consequences of this? Why, why is this important today? Is it's not just a camp. We no longer have these policies in place. The government no longer uses that under the language and that under the right language. No longer segregate public housing. We're not even building public housing at all. What difference does it make today? Well, those developments uh, in the mid 20th century, mostly working class developments like Levittown, um, but some more affluent ones as well. But the ones in Levittown, small homes, 750 square feet, uh, two bedrooms, one bath, sold at the time for $100,000 each in today's time. Today's inflation just tonight was eight, nine, ten thousand dollars at the time. Any working class family 
can afford to buy a home for $100,000 with a 20 or 30 year mortgage and defer their work term. Will that, will that trend go down? Can the blacks and whites could equally afford to buy those homes? Uh, African Americans were prohibited from buying them. Uh, whites were incentivized to do a white family could move out of the public housing and into a single family home subsidized by the FHA and the VA and pay less than monthly housing costs than they were paying for rent in public housing. African Americans were required by public policy to remain renting apartments in urban areas. Today, those homes sell for $300,000, $500,000. $500, maybe more in some areas. Some of those smug self-satisfied areas that they can't afford sell for twice that amount. Those homes are no longer affordable to working class families of either race. Um, we ended those policies. Okay. Uh, we ended those those policies. Uh, we no longer follow those policies. In 1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act. Um, the Fair Housing Act, in effect, said, so, okay, African Americans, you can now move into the left town. You can now move into the little boxes of that stuff. Those homes are unaffordable. To work, I'm not talking about poor people, are unaffordable to work in middle class families of any race. The result is that today, Levittown um, is a, a community that is in a broader area of New York, for example, that's about 15. 20% African-American. Uh, town is about 2% African-American. So the difference between that 2% and the 15 or 20% that um, you would expect if these policies had been followed is the unremitied, ongoing consequence of these policies. Uh, here in this community, I asked before, uh, this community is in a metropolitan area of what? 30% African American, and this community has a 1% African American population because of those policies that were followed in the 20th century by our government. Um, the white families who bought those homes gained over the next few generations equity, wealth, and the appreciation of the value of those homes 200, 300, $400,000 in wealth. African Americans gain no such wealth required to continue living in apartments in urban areas. The result is that today, African American incomes, what they earn from wages, are about on average 60%, 60% of white incomes. Uh, there's another story, whole story behind that. That would be the third lecture, I think. <laughs> <laughs> just accept, just accept it, that, that we have a 60% income ratio. You would think with a 60% Reality is that while well, average African American incomes are sixty percent of whites, average African American wealth is ten percent of whites, and that enormous disparity between a sixty percent income ratio and a ten percent wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that's done to remedy either in this community or in the community. You add that wealth gap, which is the primary determinant of social inequality in this country today to the achievement gap and health disparities and the mass incarceration and the threats to our democracy. And I think maybe you will agree with me that our failure to remedy these civil rights violations is the single, single biggest problem, domestic problem we face as a society. There are others as well. We have enormous income inequality quite aside from race, although it's largely supported by the racial polarization Well, the policies to remedy residential segregation are easy to develop. Housing experts know what they are. I can tell you what some of them are. They are easy to develop. What's missing? What's missing is the political will to enact them. Uh, a new civil rights movement that is going to take on the task of picking up where the last one left off and mobilizing the country to uh, insist that we adopt such policies. I can give you a few examples.
samples, so for, uh, I won't go into it much because it's new civil rights movement, it's the primary need, not more policy experts coming up with policies. But for example, those homes and places like Levittown or here, or um, Daly City in San Francisco, should be purchased by the government at market rates and be sold to African Americans, qualified African Americans. Some poor people that are involved with African Americans for hundred thousand dollars. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. We need to bring up the population of Levittown, African American population of Levittown, up to about fifteen percent, and the population of Deerfield as well. Um, that's at the high end. We should abolish zoning laws that are explicitly designed to keep. African Americans um, out of middle class communities. They prohibit construction of anything but single family homes on large lot sizes. Uh, no, no townhouses, no single family homes even on smaller lot sizes. Those only ordinances perpetuate an unconstitutionally created situation and should be challenged. At the low end, we maintain programs today that reinforce segregation of low income families. The biggest program we have for um, low-income African Americans and Latinos, and, and but mostly disparately those, those groups, but others as well, is a program run by the Treasury Department, the U.S. Treasury Department, called the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit. Um, that program is a, a subsidy to developers to build housing for low-income families. It reinforces segregation because we make the same bargain with low-income housing as those. Who make 49. It's easier to build low-income housing in already low-income neighborhoods. Why should that developer come out to Deerfield and try to build a development that has low-income units in it? Have all our community meetings. That's why we wanted to bring black and brown people into your community. He can go build in a, in a low-income neighborhood and uh, build easily and put a sign in the window, and low-income people will walk by and see a sign for rent. Why not do it that way? and it reinforces segregation. Uh, the other program we have for low-income families is called the Section 8 voucher program. You may have heard of that. It's not a subsidy to developers, so it's a subsidy to um, families who, uh, whose incomes aren't sufficient to uh, rent an apartment at market rates. And that program, for the same reason, also reinforces segregation because landlords won't take Section 8 vouchers in middle-class neighborhoods. So where, where is a voucher holder going to go? Except in already low-income segregated neighborhoods. There are exceptions. But on the whole, these two programs, both reinforce segregation, both of them can very easily be modified. It wouldn't cost a lot of money, like buying up homes for $500,000 and reselling them to African Americans. This would cost very, virtually nothing. What's missing is that we're a little modify these programs. So um, we need a new civil rights movement to demand these kinds of programs to help us, all of us, face up to our responsibilities as American citizens to redress segregation. I, I mentioned to somebody that before the, the, the meeting began this evening that the, I mean, I'm working with a group of national civil rights leaders who are planning to develop such an organization. And um, I'm hoping that sometime in the next year they'll be, be ready to announce it. Participating in that, you can give me your contact information before you leave, and I'll put you on their list to, to keep me notified. But I want to thank you for your attention, um, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions or take comments to the extent you have them. Thank you.
talking about the Democratic Party nationally. It was much more virulent in the South, but there was a national assumption in the Democratic Party. And, and the example I give this in the book, you know, I'll tell the story very briefly. Of, of, you know, the, the, the federal government before the New Deal was very small. It was a small federal government. The, uh, the Republican administrations of around the turn of the 20th century of, of McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft created the civil service that uh, was integrated, fully integrated civil service in Washington. That's where the federal government was located. It wasn't the national force the way it is today. And the black and white workers worked for the federal government in the civil service in the first you know, decade or so of the 20th century. And the last decade is the 19th century. In 1912, Woodrow Wilson was elected president. He was a Democrat, segregationist from the South. He had moved to New Jersey to become a, a professor of Princeton. So he, people think of him as from New Jersey, but he was a Southerner and no other segregationist. And upon taking office in 1913, he um, embarked on a program to segregate the federal civil service, which had previously been integrated. Um, curtains were placed in federal office buildings to separate black and white clerical workers. All black, black civil servants who supervised whites were fired because it was no longer permissible for an African American to supervise white in federal civil service. Uh, separate facilities were built in basements for black clerical workers for civil service to use. Well, this was a policy that, that you know, implemented the Woodrow Wilson administration. And one of the biggest departments in government at that time was the Navy Department. And the official responsible for implementing this program of segregation in the Navy Department was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1913? Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt. So I'm not suggesting in any way that this was Franklin Roosevelt's idea that he would come up with it on his own, but he certainly did not object. It was part of the assumptions of the Democratic Party at the time. And uh, he willingly went, went along with it. I can give you many, many other examples to illustrate this, but you know, the, the African Americans voted overwhelmingly for Herbert Hoover in 1932. They did not vote for Roosevelt. In 1936, they switched and overwhelmingly voted Democratic, and they still vote Democratic today. Well, why did they switch in 1936 that the government was doing this? No, if you think that's obvious. They were making the same bargain that Douglas made in 1949. Segregated housing was better than those housing at all. And they were getting economic benefits on a segregated basis during the New Deal that they needed and that they had never before received. The Republicans were an integrationist party, but they weren't providing any economic benefits to working class families. So the, the African Americans switched and became Democrats. Um, but I could go on and on about this. I'm, 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 it's fresh in my mind because uh, yesterday I gave him a lecture in uh, Hyde Park at the Franklin Roosevelt Museum. <laughs> I was engaged in a discussion with the uh, librarians there about it. So it's, my mind is full of this stuff now. Um, I have two things. One is, um, I met you earlier. My name's Gail Gand, and there's an after meeting to discuss the renaming of Mitchell Park, if you'd like to join us tonight over at Potbelly following this discussion. But I also wanted to ask you about, um, one of the things I had heard about that they used as a tool to segregate were highways. And I've heard the talk that like 290 in Chicago was put where it is to, to keep African Americans from being able to cross over into the downtown area where the good jobs are, and is that, is that typical that metropolitan areas do that? Yeah, I don't know about 290, but I do know about the Dan Ryan Expressway, which is such a clear example yeah, that's of a highway. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is that named 290 now? I don't know. No. 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 All, I know, all I know, you know, is the Dan Ryan Expressway. That's yeah. clearly a boundary yeah. that was created to separate black from white families. And the manual that I talked about recommends this as a strategy to, uh, so it was a thing. Oh yes, yes. yes. And in any, this is in many cities. So I forget. I was talking to somebody uh, here earlier. I forget who um, who came from Hamtramck and, and uh, outside the 
Detroit. That's another place where a highway to the Chrysler plant was used to uh, create segregation. In that case, not to separate black from white neighborhoods, but it was routed to um, destroy the only black neighborhoods in Hamtramck and to force them out of there and back into the city of Detroit. Um, in my book, uh, I think, I don't remember, I did so much of this research, how old I went into the book, but I think I talked about Miami as another example. Yes, I do. question about the Supreme Court case that you mentioned in 2007 mm -hmm. with Seattle, Louisville, et cetera. Um, I mean, just in the speech tonight, you, you give so many uh, persuasive arguments on the de jure versus the de facto. I, I, I'm curious or at a loss as to how the lawyers couldn't have presented that at the court, um, the history, just kind of like you did. and wasn't even your field. You know, you said here's education, but it, it, it just seems kind of obvious. Um, and I guess Roberts couldn't see that, or if, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. The Supreme Court, as I think, if you didn't know it already, you're learning it these days, is a political institution. And uh, the Supreme Court has uh, flipped on issues of race so many times in my history, and you know that. surprise you that they make these decisions based on their political preferences and not on, on careful legal reasoning. I mean, what about, you know, let's not talk about the Supreme Court. Let's talk about progress versus Mitchell. Um, the, the district court here said that uh, the motives of voters can't be uh, examined. Uh, but I told you that it's not the court's job to, to wonder whether a law, a referendum was adopted for racial Motives. Well, that's absurd. The Constitution specifically, the Constitution specifically requires government to resist private prejudice, not to embrace it. I mean, if that, if the, if the principle that the court, the district court, articulated, progress versus initial held, then we could violate civil rights left and right simply because majority is one of them. So um, I can't explain. The reasoning behind the Supreme Court, but um, I do know it's a political institution. You know, in the 1930s, you know, I'll just say this now, I'm kind of cute. In the 1930s, <laughs> the Supreme Court said that you know, wage laws were unconstitutional, child labor laws were unconstitutional, health and safety laws were unconstitutional, all of this, all the New Deal programs were unconstitutional, the, the National Recovery Act was unconstitutional. And in 1936, Roosevelt was elected with such an overwhelming majority that uh, the Supreme Court got scared. And all of a sudden they said, oh, well, maybe you know, there's these things are constitutional after all. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I'm sure that, that uh, the justices had some contorted legal reasoning to explain why it suddenly became constitutional. But I don't uh, think John Roberts makes his decisions based solely on uh, legal reasoning. My dad, back in 1965, was the first black degree engineer hired by Procter & Gamble back in the 60s. And I remember the stories about how difficult it was in Cincinnati to buy a house for our family. So I've heard those stories in, in the family. You're right. In 2009, my family moved to the state of Illinois to Lincolnshire. And we, the five of us, increased the black population in Lincolnshire <laughs> by 10%. <laughs> Thank you. So there were 50, and we made 55. Um, my question for you, as you can imagine, when you get these populations in, it affects what happens in the schools. Um, the teachers that you hire, the administration, the policies. So what you're talking about from the government to housing now is flowing into education and we can go on and on. You made a comment and I wanted to ask you to um, um, say some more about that. Um, right now we're dealing with a lot of incidences in school and dealing with race, a made-up construct based on power. You said something about um, you think it's going to take another civil rights movement to move the needle. Um, I'm finding that 
there are some populations within the African American community who we didn't pass on the history about the civil rights movement and the purposes and now we've got some kids who are blacks and these things are happening and they're not speaking up. So could you say some more about why you think it's gonna take a civil rights movement to move the needle away from this race and power thing to something that's more productive and inclusive? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I think it um, talks like this around the country. And um, I mean, it's not surprising to me, I understand, but you know, if I speak to groups of young people, African Americans, the only thing they know about the civil rights movement is Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. That's it. Because uh, how would they know anything else? Right. I mean, I thought it. Right. Um, in the course of this book, I, I uh, examined, in the course of doing research, I examined all the history textbooks that are commonly used in American history, in American high school surveys. You know, I was an education, still an education analyst at that time. You know, since research, I found that everyone who lies about it, everyone lies about it. <laughs> I'm uh, just curious if you looked into the uh, public housing situation in the Southwest, uh, Texas, Arizona, for example, where you have totally different demographics than you've had uh, in the rest of the nation. Well, um, Texas and California <coughs> have a different history than the one I've been describing. Some of it's similar, and I talked about the housing for <coughs> war workers and you know, Richmond and Berkeley. You know, the African Americans are not the predominant minority in the Southwest or in California. It's, it's Latinos. It's, and uh, there are many instances of uh, state sponsored discrimination against Latinos, uh, both in schools and elsewhere. There were segregated schools uh, for uh, Latinos. Um, I tell a story. I'm not There is a story in the book about the first public housing program under the United States Housing Act, which is not, which was the successor to the Public Works Administration I talked about. And it was built in Austin, Texas. And it was built in Austin, Texas because the main proponent of the public housing in Congress at that time was the congressman from Texas. And so we've got um, the, uh, uh, the, the first projects built in Austin. And that was the new who produced it, the Secretary of State, was in 1930. Yeah. So we got the first public housing project. And there were three projects. 
one for African Americans, one for whites, one for Mexican Americans in, in Austin. There's a difference, though, and this is something I, I, I have to emphasize. Once the project for African Americans was built, the, uh, the segregated project in Austin, the city of Austin embarked on a plan to force, force all African Americans in the city to move to the neighborhood of the public housing project. And that was easy to do because schools were segregated, libraries were segregated, so they could simply close schools for black, black kids in other parts of the city and force families to move to this area near the public housing project if they wanted their children to be able to go to school. There was not a similar policy followed for Mexican Americans. So the segregation was severe, but nothing rises to the level except perhaps um, for the uh, you know, experimented with Native Americans, but nothing rises to the level of uh, the failure, really, of this country to confront the legacies of slavery when it comes to African Americans. So Latinos, yes, there was state-sponsored discrimination against them. Uh, there are remedies that are necessary, but the biggest problem we face is the divide between whites and blacks in this country, in my judgment. Let me take one more question. Okay. Oh, I just wanted the contact information if we want to get on your list. Just write out your we, name. Uh, we made a book sheet. Yeah. Oh, provide the book signing. So if you want to get on the list, there's oh, a sheet okay. over there where you can sign up. Yeah, so or you can just give me a slip of paper. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're not mine, we're not mine. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much then.